Hi, my name is Stephanie Townrow. I'm the Director of Education and Public Programs at Lancaster History. And I'm here today to tell you a little bit about one of my favorite people in the world, Harriet Lane. Harriet was the niece of President James Buchanan and a truly remarkable lady. We first organized this talk around an event called History Happy Hour, where the bar made rose-inspired cocktails inspired by Harriet's love of roses. And Harriet really did love roses. She dressed herself in roses. She used them to accessorize her outfits. Uh, when she went to the White House for Buchanan's inauguration, she wore roses on her dress. I'll talk a little bit about that later. She also established a conservatory in the White House. Uh, she was the first person to have built this enormous glass-walled conservatory uh, adjacent to the state dining room in the White House, and she grew plants there from all over the world. It became a really famous and celebrated place uh, to, to see a show of flowers from all over the world. So basically flowers were her thing, roses were her thing, um, and so we, we created a rose cocktail to be inspired by her love of roses. She also loved drinking, so a happy hour would have been a really appropriate event for Harriet. Uh, in the Victorian era, women didn't really drink openly. That was seen as kind of uh, beneath women, but Harriet made an exception and she was often seen drinking openly. One White House guest that visited the White House commented on how she was a, a drinker and a, even a small-time gambler. Uh, they wrote this uh, when, they, when they went to the White House. Without concern for religious judgment, she played card games for small stakes and indicated her view on temperance by drinking wine openly at formal White House dinners. This is not something that maybe we're scandalized by today, but it was extremely scandalous in Harriet's era. During one formal dinner where the White House hosted a prince from France, Harriet actually uh, was caught with the prince from France and a bunch of dignitaries in an alcove drinking wine conspicuously. Um, and what had happened, according to Harriet, was that they found a bottle of a rare vintage. They decided to open it up and toast to Harriet. And Harriet's response to them was, and can I not drink to my own health? So they poured her a glass too, since after all the toast was to her, she decided she'd like to drink wine to herself. So throughout this talk, I'm going to be covering five themes that I think really make Harriet, Harriet. The first is Harriet as American royalty. The second will be Harriet as a fashion icon. The third will be Harriet as an amazing first lady. The fourth will be Harriet as a strong and resilient woman through a period of grief in her life. And the fifth will be Harriet as an excellent philanthropist and someone who's left a legacy that we still care about today. First, a little bit of background on Harriet. She was the niece, as I said, of President Buchanan. She came to live with Buchanan here in Lancaster, actually in the room that I'm sitting in now, uh, when she was 11 years old. Uh, she came here because her two parents had passed away of tuberculosis and Buchanan, being her uncle, uh, essentially adopted her and raised her. Buchanan really was a father figure to Harriet. He took a real liking to her and he raised her to be an outstanding woman and, and really his, his closest confidant and, and daughter in many ways. Harriet uh, ended up going with Buchanan to the White House when she was only 26 years old and she became a really precedent setting and interesting first lady. Throughout her life, Harriet lived in Lancaster from the age of 11 until she got married when she was 35, uh, minus a little time in the White House and, and of course many travels abroad. Uh, and then after Buchanan died, she inherited his home at Wheatland and lived here until the 1880s on and off. Uh, so actually, sort of mathematically, she, she lived in Lancaster longer than Buchanan did and truly she is Lancaster's first lady. I think that makes her a really special figure. So Harriet was American royalty, according to me, and here's why I think that. 
uh, when Buchanan was, uh, before he was president, he was ambassador to England and he took Harriet along with him. Uh, she was only 24 at the time that he went to England and she went and lived with him in London for over a year. And that was really her entry into international society. And she was embraced by people like Queen Victoria. Victoria uh, really loved Harriet. Harriet was spunky and young and enthusiastic and athletic and, and Queen Victoria was none of those things. And I think perhaps she she really just admired Harriet for some of those qualities. Um, she also said uh, herself of a few qualities that Harriet had that she really admired. Uh, the first was that Harriet had a quote, expert skill in performing a ritual curtsy. She had a deft handling of her cumbersome dress train and she had an agility in dressage, which is the formal horse riding. So those three qualities uh, maybe don't impress us very much today, although I suppose if somebody had a nice curtsy, I would be uh, impressed by them. But for, for the queen, for British monarchy, uh, having a nice curtsy, riding a horse, uh, being able to handle your dress train, those are things that really, really impressed Queen Victoria. Uh, so much so that she uh, celebrated Harriet. She decided to uh, mandate that Harriet be given a formal protocol status of a wife of an ambassador, even though she should have gotten a lower status as only the niece of an ambassador. So the queen really advocated for Harriet and enjoyed, enjoyed her. The other elite folks of London society also loved Harriet. Um, the queen took her around to parties, introduced her to a lot of uh, landed gentry, and um, particularly these super old lords uh, just loved Harriet. Um, I, they claim that she had sort of this astounding, refreshing quality because, and this is a quote from one of, one of them, she was not intimidated by any official regardless of rank. Uh, I'm not sure that this is such a good thing. This seems to me to be a little bit of a, a risk, but for Harriet, young and beautiful and uh, American, she seemed to have gotten away with it. And actually a lot of the really old lords uh, just loved her. And, and Queen Victoria tried to set her up for marriage to a lot of these guys. Uh, most of them, Harriet didn't like. First of all, they were super old. And second of all, she, she claims that, and this is a quote from Harriet, they talked too much, but said very little. Not exactly husband material, but there was a man named Sir Fitzroy Kelly that Harriet really took a liking to. He was a multimillionaire, which definitely helped, uh, but he was also 40 years older than Harriet. And uh, so, so she actually liked him. She wrote to a friend, he is clever and talented and very rich. Uh, but unfortunately, his old age, and I think the fact that she would permanently have to live in England, uh, definitely uh, turned her off and, and ultimately became a deal breaker. And it's really a testament in some ways to Buchanan's feminism that he encouraged her not to marry him, even though, of course, he would have elevated Harriet's status and, and wealth significantly. Uh, Buchanan didn't want her to, to marry for money. He uh, wrote to her not to, quote, rush precipitously into matrimonial connections. So he wanted her to take her time in finding the right guy. And I think that's a, a pretty cool thing about Buchanan. For her part, Harriet was content to pleasantly flirt with lots of men and be young and free. Uh, one of my favorite Harriet quotes is uh, once she said, those, and she's talking about boyfriends there, uh, those are pleasant but dreadfully troublesome. And I think uh, we ought to embroider this on a pillow. After her time in England, Harriet went to France where she was presented to Napoleon III and his wife, Empress Eugenie. Empress Eugenie and Queen Victoria were two of the it girls in Europe, and they were about the same age as Harriet. They were all within 10 years of each other. Eugenie and Victoria wielded an incredible amount of political power and social influence. Of course, Victoria was the monarch, but Eugenie also influenced Napoleon III in a lot of ways. And they also set styles and were very admired. At this time, they were quite young. They were very admired by Europeans. So Harriet learned under these two powerful, influential women. She went back to America and essentially she formed what I would consider the third in this international triumvirate of powerful, influential women. She went to become the first lady only a few years after that. And for that reason, I really call Harriet American royalty. 
Harriet was also a fashion icon. Uh, of all of her skills, her most practiced was probably shopping. In looking through the letters uh, that she's writing while she's in England, I'm pretty sure she's spending more time thinking about what kind of outfits she's going to wear than actually wearing the outfits to any parties. Uh, she spends a lot of time planning her outfits and shopping. Uh, we have a letter from her to a friend where she says, quote, my court dress is now absorbing most of my attention. This is rather intense. In case you're wondering, we do have a lot of records of the different outfits that Harriet wore while she was in England. Uh, the most beautiful was apparently a pink number. It was a pink petticoat with a long silk train, and the whole outfit was trimmed with apple blossom flowers and roses, and it was really the talk of the town. In fact, so much so that people were talking and talking about her outfit, and Buchanan displayed uh, his true, you know, jerkiness in, in this instance, where uh, he said to her that people were talking so much about her outfit that, quote, a person would have supposed you were a great beauty. When Harriet's admirers asked Buchanan, are there many other handsome women in, in America? He replied, this is a direct quote, yes, and many much handsomer. So I think there's uh, a little bit to say that maybe this is why Buchanan didn't have a wife. What a, what a jerky response. Uh, but certainly her outfits were definitely the talk of the town. Harriet uh, sort of got revenge on Buchanan through retail therapy. After her time in England, she went to Paris and went on this enormous, huge shopping trip. And she came back to America with custom Parisian outfits made by some of the best fashion houses in, in Paris, such as the House of Worth. She even had her own little silk shoes with her name embroidered in them. And she really had quite, quite the wardrobe. Uh, and it's at this time that she's a few years later becomes first lady with this humongous custom French wardrobe. And certainly it made an impact. Even on her first night as, for, at first, as first lady at Buchanan's inaugural ball, she premiered uh, the dress that I showed you earlier. This dress was a scandalous, low cut European style dress that had a garland of roses running diagonally across her chest and down her hips. The dress was an instant hit partly because Harriet ended up lowering the neckline an extra two and a half inches. So this was quite scandalous and you can see that, that men loved it and women wanted to wear it. Almost overnight, American women lowered their own necklines and crazily, we can actually see pictures of Mary Todd Lincoln at, at Lincoln's inauguration four years later. Mary Todd is legitimately plagiarizing the same dress and her dress looks almost identical to Harriet's. So you can see that this was an instant hit and really cemented Harriet as a trendsetter and a fashion icon, even on her very first day becoming the first lady. The main thing that I hope you take away from, from my talk uh, today is that Harriet was an amazing first lady. Because she became the first lady in her 20s, she was like no other first lady we had ever really had before. Uh, she followed a lot of sort of dour older women who uh, were barely in the public eye, were certainly not known for their fashion or their vibrancy, and Harriet was the complete opposite. She was young and enthusiastic, fashionable, vibrant. Uh, one newspaper wrote, quote, the sight of this golden beauty standing beside the grand and gray old man made a delightful contrast, which thousands flocked to see. Buchanan had raised Harriet to be able to fill the role of his hostess. He sent her to all the best boarding schools where she learned things like etiquette, how to ride a horse. Of course, we know she learned how to curtsy. Um, but he also instilled in her an understanding of politics and current events. Uh, and he really encouraged her in an era when women couldn't vote, he encouraged her to really understand politics. And that made her a fantastic first lady. Because we might think that being a first lady is a relatively ceremonial role. It's not. Uh, a good first lady wields an incredible amount of political power. Harriet knew how to seat people at formal dinner parties to put friends together and foes apart. She had a responsibility to control the conversation and she knew how to control the conversation uh, around political uh, topics, but also people said she had a great way of just putting people at ease. So she was really fantastic uh, in this role. Uh, 
even in school, uh, she she was known to be a really intelligent pupil. She she learned all the things that they were supposed to learn, the arithmetic, and she knew how to speak fluent French and Latin and all that. Um, but she also had a spunk about her that made her a real special student. A lot of the teachers complained that she was a troublemaker, and one even called her a young domestic outlaw, which I think is just the coolest thing to be called. So. Uh, you can see this a person with that personality took on the role of first lady and really did a fantastic and precedent setting job. Um, while first lady, she had to host entertainment for visiting dignitaries. She hosted a delegation of over 100 Japanese delegates visiting America for the first time that made a huge splash. And she also hosted the Prince of Wales, who would be the future King of England, King Edward. He made a, the first royal visit to the American uh, people while Buchanan was president and um, Harriet was responsible for organizing a lot of his entertainment. The Prince of Wales had a huge crush on Harriet. Seriously, uh, he was writing to his mother, the Queen, about how much he loved her. And apparently Harriet charmed him by taking him bowling. She shut down a gymnasium in Washington, D.C., and they went and bowled a game of 10 pins and uh, leave it to Harriet. She didn't, she didn't, uh, take uh, any pause in, in winning, uh, really creaming the prince in, in this game of bowling. Uh, a newspaper reported, quote, Miss Lane, with very little effort, outrolled the prince. So that was enough to really charm the prince, I guess, but he also felt a little bit uh, maybe self-conscious of his own athleticism. We know because uh, since it was a gymnasium, they had some brass rings that were hanging from the ceiling, and he actually uh, went on to perform a, a sort of spontaneous routine from the brass rings as a way of, of I guess, impressing Harry and improve, proving his athleticism. Um, and there's no word on, on whether that actually impressed Harriet. She was the first first lady to be called the first lady. Uh, because she was Buchanan's niece and not his wife, there was some question about what to call her and the press was sort of searching for a name, uh, a term to use. They tried using our democratic queen. Uh, some tried using our Republican princess. Uh, neither of those royal terms seemed to have caught on with Americans, so they, they settled for our fair first lady. And she was consistently referred to as the first lady as a formal title for herself, and she was the first one to do that. Uh, she was also the first first lady to have her photograph disseminated widely uh, to the nation. Really, she was the first lady uh, in the dawn of photography. Buchanan's inauguration had been the first inauguration that was photographed, and she was one of the first first ladies that stood for a formal photograph. She agreed to have her, her photo distributed as a carte de visite. And um, because of that, the photos of Harriet became a very popular commodity. And for many Americans, I believe she was the first first lady they ever visually saw. And that's really important, I think. So I want to tell you a little bit about how Harriet was a strong and resilient woman. We've been talking about her being funky and cool and young and spunky, but uh, that's only a piece of Harriet. Uh, underneath all that, she was all also uh, very troubled and she was grieving most of her life from so many losses of her, her dear family members over her life. Um, of course, she came to live with Buchanan because her two parents died uh, when she was a little girl uh, because they had tuberculosis. And she was the sixth of seven siblings, so one of the youngest of the siblings. But five out of her six siblings died before she even got to the White House when she was in her mid-20s, uh, many of them even much earlier than that. So she was constantly losing some of her, her really dear siblings. Um, and the last brother that she had surviving died just after the White House years. So by her early 30s, she actually lost all six of her, her siblings and her two parents. She did marry uh, to a man named Henry Elliott Johnston, who was a wealthy banker from Baltimore. So she did a good job uh, waiting to find the right guy under Buchanan's uh, guidance. And she found somebody who was a really nice, uh, successful guy and incredibly wealthy and her age. So um, probably a win in all, in all angles. Uh, and they had two sons. Of course, it, um, it wasn't too long before the grief struck again, uh, two years after 
Harriet married Henry Buchanan passed away of old age. And then within the first two decades of her marriage, unfortunately, she lost both sons. They died at the ages of 12 and 14 of rheumatic fever. And then she lost her husband, Henry. Uh, he died just a year after the last son died uh, of pneumonia. I share this sad information not to really make you depressed, but just to underscore how uh, strong and resilient Harriet really was. She, through it all, remained active in society, remained uh, kind of somebody that American women admired. They, they really just looked up to her. She, she really remained in the public image uh, despite all of this terrible loss. But of course her loss is part of her legacy. It came to color who she is as a person and the legacy that she left behind. Even here in Lancaster, we can see uh, elements of that. When we look at St. James Episcopal Church, which is in downtown Lancaster, we see that there's a beautiful stained glass window that Harriet actually constructed in memory of her two sons. There are also windows in her church in Baltimore, St. John's Episcopal Church in memory of the two sons and many other reminders. One other reminder is kind of the root of this last theme, which is that Harriet became an amazing philanthropist. Harriet and her husband, Henry, right after the death of their last son, founded the Harriet Lane Home for Invalid Children in Baltimore. And this was a home set up to care for Baltimore's needy children up until the age of 14, which was the age of Harriet's last son when he passed. Um, this went on throughout Harriet's lifetime, but then in her will, she left an additional $400,000 to fund the Harriet Lane Home. That's equivalent to about $11 million in purchasing power today. So it's a significant amount of money. The Harriet Lane home negotiated by Harriet Lane's trustees of her will merged with Johns Hopkins Hospital and it became in the 20th century, a cutting edge pediatric research facility and a residency program for pediatricians. They uh, published a book called the Harriet Lane Handbook that was used by pediatricians as a reference manual and it's actually still used today. Uh, and it's also an app, which I'm sure Harriet would have been really surprised by. The Harriet Lane home is also still surviving. It, it lives as what's known as the Harriet Lane Clinic, which is an outpatient clinic that is affiliated with the pediatric wing of Johns Hopkins Hospital. So you see her legacy in there today. She also founded a school called St. Albans School for Boys, which was attached to the National Cathedral in Washington, DC, and that school is still around. And she also, also left a, a wonderful gift to us, the American people, which is her art collection. She had a huge and amazing European and American art collection, which she left to be uh, used as the basis of a new museum that was free and open to the public to allow Americans to appreciate art. And that museum was the Smithsonian American Art Museum, which is in Washington, DC. And if you go there today, you can see a lot of the works from Harriet's collection on display. And she really left a tremendous gift to the American people through this collection. After Harriet's death in 1903, she died at the age of 73. A Lancaster newspaper said, quote, if her uncle had done his part as well as she did hers, history of a different sort would be written. And I think that is so true. Buchanan is probably in the bottom five of presidents, but Harriet is absolutely in the top five of first ladies. And I hope that you've taken away from this a better understanding of the dynamic uh, and amazing woman who served as our country's first lady. Uh, her name has really been forgotten to time, but it shouldn't be. She was really a, an amazing precedent setting and important. First Lady. Thank you for taking the time to, to listen to me talk a little bit about Harriet, and I hope that you'll continue to explore her history. We have a Google cultural exhibit that's posted to our website all about Harriet that covers some things that I haven't talked about today. And of course, you can visit Lancaster History, take a tour of Wheatland, see the beautiful room that I'm sitting in, and learn even more about this fantastic First Lady. Thank you very much.